Welcome to class one of three of 3D Without Glasses about autostereoscopic 3D displays. I'm Greg Favalora and I have been researching and developing 3D displays for over 20 years. I work at Optics for Hire, a product development firm near Boston. Are you interested in 3D such as 3D cinema and stereoscopic video games? Do you wonder if it will be possible to see 3D without needing to wear special eyeglasses? It is possible. After you watch these three courses, you'll be able to name and understand a wide array of auto stereo displays. 3D displays have been shown in movies at least since the 1970s. This might color the public's impression of what exactly the state of the art is. Are these special effects? Are they real? Here's one funny case. This is a clip from a show called CSI New York. You could see a volumetric 3D display, which is a type of display you'll learn about, and it's projecting a 3D image of a brain. That dome really is the dome of a 3D display, uh, but that imagery was added as a special effect. 3D is depicted in movies and military grant proposals and in corporate and student research projects, but what's real? About these classes, you'll learn why things look 3D. Some of those reasons are hopefully going to be new to you. You'll learn the underlying challenges of why it's hard to make a good 3D display. And this is mostly a survey of lenticular displays, parallax barrier displays, volumetric, holographic, and other systems. Most of those will be covered in uh, class two of three. There's really no prerequisites. Uh, we assume you're generally scientifically minded. Um, there's no math or optics beyond some really simple basics, uh, though some sections are slightly more technical than others. By the way, these classes were produced by a company called Optics for Hire we invent and improve optics-based products. For example, LED light shapers, complicated lenses, and entire prototypes that use electronics and mechanical engineering. We're three, uh, 25 people in three countries. Our CEO is John Ellis, and uh, I'm Greg Favalora. I've been developing 3D displays since 1988, have some patents and publications in the area of 3D, and help run the annual conference on 3D, which is the SPIE conference on stereoscopic displays and applications. I founded Actuality Systems, which made volumetric and other 3D displays for 12 years, and then Optics for Hire acquired its assets and patents. If you need optical, electronic, or mechanical design or prototyping, please keep Optics and Hire in mind. Uh, here are some of our customers with work spanning video game cameras to laser systems to LED optics. Here's the entire agenda for uh, the course. Today we'll start with the fundamentals and in follow-on courses you'll learn about quite a few interesting 3D displays. So let's get started. The fundamentals have uh, many parts. You need to understand depth cues, that is, what is it that you could see that causes you to see in 3D? What are some common ways to create three-dimensional images? Why is it so hard to make 3D and, and why does that uh, imply that you need to be able to control billions of bits per second. We'll talk about a few good enabling technologies and also sort of uh, warn you about currently impossible techniques as well as the way to figure out what is snake oil. Let's begin with a review of some depth cues. And here uh, in the picture you can see John Merritt demonstrating one of these depth cues at the SPIE conference on stereoscopic displays. Here's a collection of monocular depth cues, and by the way, I want to credit uh, and thank Neil Dodgson, who is a professor at Cambridge University, who's an expert in 3D displays, uh, as well as a variety of other things. Um, so monocular depth cues are things that cause you to think you're seeing something three-dimensional, even though uh, you're only seeing something two-dimensional. That is, it gives you the sensation of depth, even with one or only one eye open. Some of these you've probably seen before and thought about, such as occlusion. That uh, means that if two objects block one another, um, then the one in front, uh, it's sort of obvious which is the one that's in front. Uh, relative size is similar to that. So if you have two similar objects, one of them's bigger and the other one's smaller, you sort of assume the smaller one is farther away. Uh, focus. So if there's an object that is sharply focused and nearby things are kind of blurry, you deduce that the blurry things are at a different depth than the one that's sharp. Um, another one that you've probably thought about before is called foreshortening. That's on the bottom in the center. 
An example of foreshortening is that things look smaller the farther away they are. Uh, that is, parallel lines sort of appear to get close together as they recede off into the distance. Um, and that's uh, the case for the way human eyes work, though not all lens systems cause that to occur. Uh, telecentric lens systems um, basically preserve um, parallel lines regardless of how far away they are, which is sort of an interesting case to consider. Also, uh, there's motion parallax. That means that if you were to move your eye or your head, uh, then the relationship of objects with respect to each other change. That shows you that things are at different depths. A final example of one of the more obvious monocular depth cues is a texture gradient. And an example of that is looking at a field of wheat. So the wheat that's really far away might look like a solid color like gold, but as they're closer and closer the texture changes into things discernible as individual plants, and that's called a texture gradient. So here's a painting um, from 1481 that really demonstrates a lot of these depth cues at the same time. You can see foreshortening, shading, uh, the people in the foreground occlude each other, so you could assume that the ones whose entire body you can see are probably in front of the ones uh, behind them. Now, here are a number of cues that you might not have considered and certainly surprised me when I started learning about them. And I want to thank uh, one of my colleagues, um, Shojiro Nagata, who co-authored an article for the IEEE in 2000 called Just Enough Reality. That is, what are some things you could do, what are some subtle tricks you could play to sort of trick the eye into thinking you're seeing 3D? Um, there are a few of these. Uh, one that's particularly interesting is the act of looking through a small hole, and I'll show that on the next slide. But before I do that, uh, we can consider uh, a different one, like the very last one on the list is blurring one's eyes focus when viewing in stereo. So if you've ever tried watching a sporting game on TV and intentionally crossing your eyes a little tiny bit, causing them to defocus just a little bit, uh, at least for me, I get an impression that the parts of the image kind of pop out relative to things that are in the background. Uh, here's an example that I want you to try the looking through a tiny hole example on. So this is a early photograph of my son sitting at a football game and so you could see him really close to you and there's people in the stadium far far away uh, go ahead and cup your kind of close one eye and cup your hand and put it in front of the open eye as if you're looking through a tiny little tube or tiny little hole and now position it such that you could see um, a little bit of his purple hat and um, spectators far away and this might cause you to see a very slight sort of depth perception effect. So if computers are so good at rendering things that kind of look 3D, even if you see it in only one eye, what benefits does a true 3D image have? Well, there are a number of 3D cues that are simply not provided by a 2D image. So the first one is stereo or binocular parallax. That is, each eye sees a different image. This is also called stereopsis. And of course, the data that comes from your eyes to your brain are processed in a nearby but kind of interleaved regions in the visual center of your brain. The next one is motion parallax or movement parallax. Uh, if you want to sound fancy, you can call it ego motion. So that is when you move your head, the world seems to sort of change. Nearby things move at a different rate than far away things. The last two things on this list are of particular importance when you're talking about stereo displays. These are called convergence and accommodation. Convergence is how your eyes converge or swivel in and out to focus on the thing that you're looking at. So if you put your finger up in front of your face, you kind of go cross-eyed looking at it. But if you relax and look way off uh, in the distance at infinity, your eyes go parallel again. Now this is related to focus because of course you focus um, in different ways depending on how far away things are. Living in normal real life, your brain sort of has this mapping, this relationship between what convergence is supposed to go along with what accommodation. But new technologies, such as some stereoscopic viewing techniques or stereo cinema, attempt to break this natural relationship between convergence and accommodation. And that's uncomfortable for some people. For example, if you're at a movie and there's uh, something jutting a few feet or meters outside of the movie screen, your eyes will cross to make it come into view but they're still focusing way back at the screen plane, and that takes a little getting used to. 
So there's something else here that causes your brain to perceive things as truly 3D, and that's uh, that your eyes can perceive uh, intersecting rays as points. And this is a complicated idea, and it's something that will be covered in the second of three classes. But I think it's important to get your, your brain around this uh, up front. So this is an image that um, I borrowed from the Hollow Video group at the MIT Media Lab several years ago. Some 3D displays work on this technique. Um, there's a rendering step and then a reconstruction step. In the rendering step, a computer will um, depict a scene from, say, 100 different points of view. So you can see here a little box with a red dot on it and an idea of a camera that's moving along a horizontal track. And as it does it, it sees different viewpoints of that scene. To reconstruct or play back that image, you would create a display, and that display is composed of a grid of pixels, as you've seen. But there's something unusual about these pixels. These pixels can send light in multiple directions. So whereas your normal pixel on your computer screen is either on or off, uh, these pixels in this fanciful world can steer light in different directions. Why is that useful? Well, in one sense, you could say, if each pixel looks different depending on how you look at it, your two eyes will see different images and therefore you'll perceive 3D. A different um, but sort of equivalent but kind of useful way of looking at it is that you could plot how those rays of light leave those pixels and you'll see they crisscross uh, at each virtual point within that scene. So this is the if you're an engineer and you're trying to develop your own three-dimensional display, this is kind of the problem statement. The problem statement is, how on earth do you create a 3D display where the pixels can emit different amplitudes of light based on different directions leaving the screen? And most of this, uh, the follow-up class, is about just that topic. So let's uh, return to our agenda. The next step here is to learn about some common 3D architectures. Now. There's uh, quite a few, and this is a one slide as sort of a warm-up exercise. The first common 3D display, of course, is stereo headwear that's been around since the mid-1800s, and this causes your eyes very explicitly to see a different left eye image than your right eye image. Um, there are modern equivalents of stereo headwear, such as stereo cinema, or for desktop displays, a head tracking system that even knows where you're sitting. So as you move your head, you can look around objects, and the word for that is horizontal parallax. There are uh, other 3D display techniques that decompose the 3D scene into a variety of different uh, forms. One is to decompose it into uh, discrete viewpoints. So as I showed before, as you move your head around, you could see different images of the scene, but that also enables multiple people to see it at once. You could partition the scene into um, cross sections. So what I mean is, um, you can have a volumetric display that shows a picture of a brain, but it's kind of collected up like a deck of cards, and each cross-section would be one card in that deck. And there's more complex things, such as electronic holography. And, by the way, the extremes are still areas for open research. Uh, they're a little unusual, but they're still interesting, like exploiting those one-eye or monoscopic cues, or physical instances of a 3D display, such as uh, micro-explosions in a block of plastic that's illuminated. People are doing that. Or dragging a stylus filled with ink around uh, gelatin. Now, let's uh, go one step deeper. Why is it difficult to create? Well, to con consider uh, the difficulty of creating a good 3D display, let's do some simple calculations. Let's say that you want an image that's about a foot by a foot by a foot, 30 centimeters uh, cube on each side, and the image shouldn't flicker, so it will refresh 120 times a second, and people expect good color rendition, so assume it's a 24-bit color system. Well, one type of display to consider is a slice stacking, or volumetric display. Um, the way that would look in a volumetric display is like this. Um, there would be a stack of uh, images, each of which is 2D, with 300 voxels on a side, and there's uh, 300 voxel slices deep. That would require 78 gigabits of optical data per second. An alternative is a multi-view display, such as a lenticular with many, many, many views in it. Um, if you assume 120 degree field of view and one view per degree, that's almost 500 gigabits per second that you need to modulate. And if you think that's hard, some people have suggested doing electronic holography, 
And if you do it in a really traditional way that kind of mimics traditional display holograms, you'd need, you know, a thousand to two thousand line pairs per millimeter. And that relates to 43 terabytes, I'm sorry, 43 terabits per second. Now that assumes full parallax, but people have learned that if you just supply only left-right look around, you can cut that number down quite a bit. So to pull this off, there are a few enabling technologies that became available just, you know, within the last 10 or 15 years. Let's look at those enabling technologies. One of them is a fast light modulator. To make most of these displays, you need a source of light that shines onto something that then shapes or patterns the light, and then that light goes on to strike a screen that's spinning, or the light goes on to go to a flat surface that changes in time in some way. Well, still, uh, as of 2010, just about the only light modulator that's good enough for the job is, for example, the TI-DLP, or Digital Light Processing Technology. Uh, and they can modulate beams anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 or 20,000 frames per second. And some vendors sell control electronics that you can use, such as Violux so that you could send in your bit patterns and that DLP will modulate your photons for you. A second enabling technology is a fast computer. Uh, now this picture is a few years old already, um, but a fast computer that's able to process graphical data or numeric data very fast is called a GPU, uh, Graphics Processing Unit. Um, NVIDIA makes these and AMD ATI makes these. This particular one is the GeForce 8800. It's got 112 little processors in it, all running reasonably fast, and you're able to do real-time calculations of volumetric data or holographic data. Some people even use it to do intense physics calculations for fluid dynamics. Well, that's all great, um, but where's the edge between claims you can believe and claims that you should be suspicious of? For example, there are limits. Uh, on one hand, it is certainly possible to make it seem like a 3D image is just floating above a tabletop, provided that good uh, optics are inside of that tabletop. But there's some things that probably won't happen, at least not with today's physics. For example, the people in this scene can't really look through that image, unless there's some sort of display element where that picture of that planet is. Let's explain this. So the, the best explanation I've found for what's called a window violation was written by Mike Halley, who is uh, an excellent researcher of 3D displays. And what he said was really important, so I'll just read it out loud. Um, our current understanding of physics does not include a practical way of forcing photons to change direction in the absence of an optical medium. Thus, a fundamental and general statement can be made about all spatial displays, whatever its particular technology. A display medium or element must always lie along a line of sight between the viewer and all parts of a spatial image. Let's uh, review those words in terms of pictures. So here are three examples of uh, window violations. So on the left, these are all images looking down uh, at a scene, maybe in someone's living room. So on the left, a viewer is looking at an image of a boat behind a display. So the display is doing something to light to provide the impression there's an image behind the display. Or the image could be inside a whole display volume, as in a volumetric display. Or the display could even project an aerial image, a sort of an image that floats in front of the display. All these things are possible with today's technology. But uh, parts of the object will seem to fall off the edge or disappear if those parts of the image are not visible to both eyes. That is, you could see the person's right eye can't see the leftmost part of the boat because beyond it, there's no more display. So finally, let's look at a couple examples of snake oil. There are a few things that are advertised as maybe 3D, but are really 2D. For example, on the left, you see an image of the Earth, and that's projected by a 2D image source, like a monitor. And there's maybe a Fresnel lens, which is a big flat lens with a bunch of curved grooves in it. Um, that does create some sort of floating image, but that image is actually just two-dimensional. Likewise, you can buy uh, really good quote-unquote holograms, which are flat sheets of material with little microscopic patterns in it, that act like a clear projection screen for stores. So there's just a 2D projector behind this, and it 
illuminates it with a an image. But if you were to walk around it, you wouldn't be able to see around the singer. She would you just see the same image regardless of where you were standing. And a final example of claims you need to be aware of is this. There are quite a few companies that sell a large box that you plug in a video source of some animation and there's some optic on the outside that makes a floating image. Generally these work, but it's not necessarily a 3D image. Usually it's just a 2D image that floats or is visible from a few different points of view. There are many tricks to do it. Uh, one is called uh, Pepper's Ghost. There uh, are other methods as well. And the way that I personally use to see if a system really is 3D is to look at the spec sheet. And on the specification sheet there should be a parameter called Video Input. And if it only requires one video input, like a single XGA video card, a uh, video connector, then you really need to be careful. Um, you know, giving the vendor the benefit of the doubt, I guess it's possible that the system also contains really advanced software that extracts 3D data from a single 2D image and then somehow display it. But both of those steps are at the edge of today's technology and it's really unlikely. Uh, it's great if all you want is a floating eye-catching 2D image, but if you or your customer asks you to create something with walk-around 3D in which you can inspect the imagery from different sides, you really need to ask the manufacturer if that's possible. So uh, in the next class, we will be uh, talking about a variety of display technologies. So this was a quick uh, entry to kind of get your feet wet and your brain used to the ideas of 3D. And the next class, which is coming very soon, is a fairly deep survey of quite a few different display technologies that I hope you'll like a lot. Thank you for your time. Uh, congratulations for making it through class one. Feel free to email me uh, whenever you want about any of these topics. I'm at greg, G-R-E-G-G, -E -G -G, at opticsforhire.com, and that's one word, as you can see. And if you want to learn more, here's a few resources you can use. Uh, you can try stereoscopic.org, which is the 3D technical conference. There are a few um, SPIE volumes of collected really good papers on 3D displays, as well as some books that have come out recently about a variety of 3D displays. Thank you very much.